Thank you all for coming here. I hope you all had a great lunch and you've enjoyed DrupalCon very much so far. If that's the case, just raise your hand. Um, there will be some time for sessions at the uh, for questions at the end of the session. So I would appreciate um, if you were asking questions at the end. Um, this will be a lot of stuff. Um, there's been gotten a lot of thought into. Uh, what we can do in core about automated performance tracking, the ATEM tools I will kind of show, but overall it's just a lot. So, um, and it's also advanced levels, so please, uh, if there's something a lot too much going on or something, then please just ask um, after the session or during the questions. When you have a question after the session, please use the microphone um, so that it's recorded properly. So, let's start. Um, first of all, let's talk a little about the motivation. Why does Drupal need this? Why is automated performance tracking in any way useful for Drupal? I mean, we had like Drupal 5, Drupal 6, Drupal 7. We didn't need it. Why do we now need it in 8? Um, the point is the landscape has changed. Why performance was pretty important already um, years ago, it, it is way, way, way more, more important now. Um, it is a very, very important factor in the today's web square. And there's even like this, um, for mobile, you need to deliver all the page in just under one second, else users are just going to skip your site going somewhere else. And if you are having like an e-commerce site or something, then you will lose real customers. So performance is no longer something where it's like, um, yeah, I'm writing this little website and then in the end, um, if there's a performance problem, I just put in like a uh, caching system, activate the cache, and then it's all good. But sites has gotten too much more complicated. So there's authenticate users, there's user interaction, there are different ways of, uh, especially in the shopping sphere, uh, to engage users to buy products. There's real-time data that needs to be collected. All of that takes a lot of time. and why sites get more complex and more complicated and such overall also slower. Um, there are certain penalties for slower pages, like there's a Google penalty, and um, there are definitely studies that show and compare e-shops and the faster shops, the users were buying more and more. So um, performance is something you should be planning in from the start of a project, not as an afterthought. Um, so what's the current state of uh, performance tracking in Drupal? Um, we have a wonderful, fantastic performance gate. There's just one little problem. It's not enforced at all. Um, normally, every commit within Drupal that, needs to, that wants to go in, every patch needs to go through all of the gates. There's an accessibility guide. guide uh, user experience guide gate, <laughs> and uh, there's also um, a gate for um, I forgot. Uh, anyway, performance is also one of the gates uh, that's very important. But the problem is at the moment um, we cannot measure the performance, so we cannot really enforce it. We can say, well, if something is output like it's on the theme layer, then this probably touches a critical path of a page, so um, the performance is probably Im impacted by that. But in all of my performance work, what I've seen is it's not the obvious changes that are creating the big performance problems. It's that's one line little change that's done somewhere uh, that in the end makes your site 50% slower. And um, it's those things that you not even notice. It's like adding a decorator somewhere and suddenly everything is slower. But because, uh, especially in the Drupal core, we have not yet built big sites with it, um, we cannot know what impact little changes have because we're just seeing, well, it's like a Bartik or base theme in the core. And well, it's, it's fast enough, it's okay. Um, but we cannot really see what is the real impact, how would it impact once this was live, once we are building real client sites with it. And that's a problem. So the performance gate exists, but it's not really used and enforced. Um, 
the current state of performance tracking in core was kind of before it was like, hey, how long does the test suite take? Um, if you have like um, patches that go in and afterwards the test but runs were like three hours, which happened in the early development of Drupal 8, then it was like, huh, probably uh, we have a problem, especially with the CMI. There was like a big issue where the config entities were not cached yet. And um, then it was like, well, the test bots are now so much slower, it may be we have a problem here. But that was kind of one of the only indications that were overall seeing that. Then it's like, okay, some developers choose to do it. They do like a quick, oh, I just do a quick A, B minus N uh, to just check um, if the Apache benchmark is around the same or it's around the same. Okay, let's get the patch in. Let's continue work. And um, overall, only for certain obvious issues, uh, like our nice trick initiative, um, they made us profile every patch for the uh, trick initiative while other things in core like link profiler or something have been profiled just um, like the link manager have been profiled just very little um, because well that's just in the back end somewhere etc it's not front end facing um, so but with that we have probably missed all the real and hidden performance regressions um, because um, Overall, what we've seen in Drupal, and everyone was seeing Drupal 8 has gotten slower and slower and slower. But no one can tell when it happened, why it happened, and how it happened. And we had just gotten to a point where suddenly it was not just baby steps, but because we have this nice little thing called Drupal 7 as a comparison, um, you were like saying, well, Drupal 7 was that, and Drupal, 7, uh, Drupal 8 is that, what has happened? Um, but because o over the whole of the things, you were just having like a little performance regression, little performance re regression, little performance regression. Within the Drupal 8, you were not actually seeing that it gotten slower. Just in a comparison to Drupal 7, that gets very apparent. But then you were like saying, well, we now have Symfony, we have all that container stuff, we have all the other things, so um, um, that's not really... Um, a surprise. Fortunately, there's also some nice work going on um, in the contract space. Uh, Symfony has a great uh, tool, which is a Symfony debug toolbar. And there's a nice module, which is called the Web Profiler, um, which allows to at least see the query time, which database is used, and the number of DB queries per page. Pretty simple. It also creates nice little reports um, where you can see uh, things like um, caches or um, the PHP config. Uh, the web profiler, while doing a lot, is at the moment also more like an introspection tool of how many routes do you have defined, uh, what is going on on the side. It's useful, um, but it's, to my knowledge at least, not yet used by uh, core developers as much. And also it's just, again, it's local. So I can say, well, I profiled this with web profiler. It was like only 200 milliseconds slower or whatever, or 20 milliseconds slower. But do I say the truth? Maybe, maybe not. Probably, yes. Um, but it would be nice to be able to see, well, where was it 20 milliseconds slower? What happened? What did you um, uh, see that um, this was... Um, more problematic, and especially what did you test? Because if I'm changing um, the aggregator module and I'm testing the front page, there's obviously no difference. Um, the other thing is the current performance tracking is really only the uh, Drupal core. So client sites can be very different, and especially at the end of life of Drupal 7, uh, we are seeing a lot of client sites that are having like such huge complexity because they're trying to use new Drupal 8 um, paradigms, um, but um, Drupal 7 is not suitable for that because there's some code uh, that's just not going to work with that. For example, we found that the Drupal find theme functions uh, took just 300 milliseconds or 
200 milliseconds on core, but on the client side, it could be as much as 3.5 seconds. And there was, in this case, due to some other circumstances, a real problem. But it was something, it was very simple to optimize, but there was something you would never find if you were just concentrating on core. So um, that's also why, as a performance engineer, um, I say it's very important uh, to go out into the field, optimize real sites, and not just do it as an academic exercise, but because if you've ever seen a client site with 300, mod uh, 300 modules um, around 16 bean blocks and it's all loaded together and then there's fields attached to that, etc., then you're like, okay, <laughs> this is a different problem than what core might have thought about when it was kind of developed. So, um, and that's um, what I'm coming on a little later. There needs to be some ways to get more real of that. Um, overall, there are some interesting questions to answer that cannot be really be answered easily. Um, for example, is the Drupal 8 slower than Drupal 7 at the back end? Um, is, um, how much has it gotten worse? Forward pages, how much does the render cache helps? How much does it for uncached pages? What about the services? For example, there was one project um, was thinking even about Drupal 8, but because the bootstrap time was so much more than Symfony or Drupal 7, uh, it was decided to not do it um, because at the moment the web services tr of Drupal 7 was so much faster uh, that it was not worth it switching for all the benefits Drupal 8 was giving. What about the front end performance? There we are faster. Um, because we're no, not loading any JavaScript by default. Um, then how many database requests do we make? How many did we make in Drupal 7? How many are we making now? Um, another interesting question, how many bytes are transferred on average? Are we like sending 10 megabytes of data, compressed data? Um, or is it more like, well, some K, whatever. So overall, all of that leads to that we need to automate that process. It needs to be possible both for your client sites and Drupal core to automate that process to, um, to, um, to get an understanding of how much has my site gotten slower. Does my site confirm uh, to the standards that are set by the client and also for the Drupal core, uh, how does it work? Um, how can we make it that it's automatically and that it's not such a pain. Because um, I've written a little tool called XHProfKit, um, and Mark Sonnenbaum has written a tool called XHProfLib. They allow to kind of um, do several aggregated XHProf runs automatically, and um, then in the end, XHProfKit is giving you the minimum, while XHProfLib is giving you like an aggregate of all the runs and then you're getting even a much better idea of, of what the performance is like. Um, we measured every single patch for the trick theme conversions and almost every theme knows how to use um, XHProf kit from the trick initiative, but most core developers don't use it. Which makes me a little sad because it's like the tool is out there. I'm happy to help or implement in that. And, and for the trick, we've gotten really good results in that. And uh, we showed that kind of everyone can use it because if CMOS can use it, backend developers should be able to use it as well. Very simple. Um, and what turned out that when we're using this XHProf kit to profile the patches that we're doing for the trick conversions, we revealed a lot of <laughs> other performance problems in core that were not found because kind of no one was doing that extensive profiling than um, those who had to do it because the front end was always like, this needs benchmarks. Um, but overall, even with the HTH Prof kit, it was still very painful and hard work. I remember one Drupal con in Portland where we were just profiling patches. Um, Another big problem of the of the whole automation is you have to manually set up a scenario. So um, one of the standard scenarios we're using in Drupal is like 50 nodes with 20 comments or a page with 300 comments. And um, setting up that manually takes a lot of time. 
because there's an area needs to match what actually has changed in the code. As I said, if you are touching aggregator, it doesn't really help to um, profile the front page. Uh, so what we really would need in core is a common case of scenarios and um, these cases should not just be like arbitrary, like, well, we have this module, let's profile that page, um, but it should be based on real use cases, like user stories. As an administrator, I want my modules page to not longer take than one second or whatever. Or as an administrator, I want to find content in 300 milliseconds so that I'm not interrupted in my normal workflow. Those are goals, those are performance goals um, and user stories that then could be set up as scenarios and that then could be even enforced. And the nice thing is if Drupal Core had that, then you would be able to use the same scenarios, albeit maybe with a little changes, on your same on your client side. Um, especially for the theme to trick conversions, it was sometimes very, very difficult to find the page to measure and to be able to uh, do that properly. So overall, the questions to ask are, how can we make it simple? Could it be as simple as running the test suite? Um, or could we even combine it with test suite? And um, I put some work in that, there will show later. Um, but before answering that, let me um, go a little over uh, what is automated performance tracking and what would we need to track? Um, how can the performance be tracked? and what types of performance tracking are there? Uh, overall, there's a front end, there's a back end, there's a database, and there's a remote services overhead. And then there's also this little thing called scalability. Um, scalability will be important once you are featured somewhere because then your one web head is not enough. You will need like an army of them. And you will need to know how to scale them properly, how to load test them properly so that you know how much traffic do I need to be uh, able to um, ensure that my site performs with that many users. So it's all about accountability and planning properly. Um, but overall, what we are seeing here is not linear, but it's more like a tree structure. We have the front end, we have the back end, then it's talked to DDB. If the database is slow, then the front end will also be slow. If there's a remote service call that's happening like some pages like to um, query the Facebook graph uh, during the page load. That's not a good idea. Put it into a queue, make it in the background, cache it properly, and not do it during the runtime. Um, try to avoid expensive operations that you cannot control. If that um, remote service goes down and you have not set a proper timeout, and the default is 30 seconds for a Drupal HTTP request, your site will be down. Um, then for the front end, there's also the page assets like JavaScript, CSS, images. How many images do I have? How many images do I load by default? Um, how do I aggregate my JavaScript? So there's a lot of different types here uh, that are there. And overall, you can also classify all of that in time, I.O., like database I.O., input output, where CPU is doing nothing, but the uh, database is doing a lot, and memory. And memory is more important for scalability, for example. Now there's a thing um, of what to track. So um, there's the time, the speed, and performance, the raw. You could, for example, say painting the page that takes 10 milliseconds, but the block controller who's online that takes 560 milliseconds, or database request takes 300 milliseconds. Uh, that's already useful data. Um, but what's even more useful in tools like Nubelik or others uh, are providing you is to give you the average. So executing the JavaScript takes on average 50 milliseconds. It can be faster, it can be slower, and um, just going via the average, you can then maybe find outliers that are your real pain points and slow pages. Um, the root user page takes on average 7 and 80 milliseconds, or the memcache requests take 1.50 milliseconds on average. Why is that important? Because we had a site where the memcache was like responding in 14 milliseconds, one would say 40 milliseconds is not a problem. But if I have like a uh, 100 requests, that's already 1.4 seconds. And so it, it makes a difference. Um, but if you were just using it the raw data, you would probably see some fast memcache requests, some slower. But with the average, it gets pretty clear that you are having a problem. 
In this case, the Memcache server was in a different network um, and putting it into the same network solved the problem easily. Um, then there's quantitative data you can use. So um, the number of bytes that are transferred or the number of function calls. Quantitative has one big advantage. It is not dependent on external factors. Um, because if you are having like, like speed tracking, you are so dependent on CPU that it's not doing something. If you are having I.O., you are so dependent on the network that it's not doing something. Uh, but with um, quanti uh, quantitative data, you are, can be sure it's raw data that never changes and that you can reproduce uh, always. Um, then there's also the um, other quantitative data, like the number of cache hits you are having and the number of file system accesses. That's something that uh, Drupal Core has worked very hard on, uh, but contrib modules have not, and that might be also the fault of having no automated performance tracking tools that are telling you, like, hey, it's not a good idea to use require ones because that actually um, does... Uh, make a stat call to see if the file exists. And if you put your code base on NFS, you can expect bootstrap times of 500, seconds, uh, 500 milliseconds to 1.2 seconds. Uh, just had that in a, in a site. So it's very, very important to ensure that um, you're like tracking what you have included and then using just a simple include is kind of the most performant way uh, to do that. Um, what core is, is He's been trying to do so um, because even normally your disk is not busy. Assume there's some backup joke or something going on. Suddenly something that's always performing, always fast, is suddenly slow at midnight. But they're taking care of and measuring well, for example, this S trace doing the test suite. Um, well, there's so many stat calls we are doing. We should have zero of them or we should have as less as possible of them. Um, you can ensure that you're not going into that trap. Another thing is quality, and quality is very difficult to define. For example, the quality of the aggregates. Uh, quality of aggregates means how often does a user need to get a new aggregate if he's visiting your most important pages. And uh, it's difficult to define because you are trading speed um, in terms of network retrieval. Uh, for the number of bytes you are having, like the size of the aggregate versus how many aggregates you have to reload because they're not in the cache versus other factors. Um, overall, um, you have like the uh, front end parameters and that we we'll just go really quickly on. Uh, so we have the time to first byte, kind of the um, most important thing. If you, for example, seen my render cache session yesterday, we showed um, off a big pipe thing where the time to first byte was kind of trying to send the request as soon as possible and then just pushing more data afterwards, um, which is important because just after this waiting time is over, the browser can start to do something. Then there's a the parsing of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The JavaScript is executed in different stages. There's a document ready event where you could do things. There's a window.load event. So for example, um, again, and that's really just something you normally do not think about in development, but which is very important is um, if you are having something that must not be there when the user is actually coming to the page because it's like people behind the tab or something, you could as well use a window.load event uh, to add that actional functionality. And your site will be loaded faster. So not everything needs to be in behaviors and not everything uh, needs to be in the document ready event. There's possibilities to do things after the page has completely loaded already, um, which again makes it faster. Then there's the first load time uh, with no assets cached. Um, then you have like the cache hits versus the cache misses, the quality of the aggregation, as we said, the number of bytes transferred. If you want to look at that in more default, slides will be up. So then there's per perceived performance of the page, like the Facebook big pipe. Usually Facebook would have a load time of 3.5 seconds, but how many would go to Facebook if, if you like Facebook uh, anymore? Um, because it would be like, hmm, I don't really want to wait that long for just to watch what my neighbor did yesterday. Um, 
So um, due to big pipes, they're just having like after 200 milliseconds, you're seeing something and then your stream appears and then some other information appears and then in the end, the ads appear. Um, um, you can even try that out if you go to Facebook and you put like um, question mark big pipe equals zero flash, then you can see how slow Facebook would be normally if it was like a Drupal site, a standard Drupal site currently. Um, how, to, how can we measure the front end? How can we um, now in 2014? Uh, that was not possible before, but uh, browsers have much improved on that. It's no longer just taking a look at click. How long does it take? Oh, I perceive it's a little faster. Um, no, we can actually time that. Uh, most uh, Chrome has a network inspector. There's a great profiling tool in Safari, Chrome, Firefox, where you can actually see now it's painting, now it's executing the JavaScript, now it's loading some images, now it's waiting for something. and um, but there's also the possibility to record all of that, and that is the HTTP archive 1.2 files, and that's what's also used by the uh, famous web page test org, uh, where you can even download that HAR file and then take a look exactly of when was loaded what. There's also the browser timing API, so you, for example, for web page test org, you can send more information like that. Um, so that better possibilities to test things, um, but what you really need are realistic scenarios. Um, I've tried to do a little web page test org with pages that were dumped out of the test suite. They were wonderfully fast. They were using stock, almost no CSS, no markup, and almost no content. Um, that is for the front end not really useful. Um, because what we are having is complex pages with complex widths, uh, with complex functionality, and um, to determine the aggregation quality, it's not enough to say, hey, I fit the front page, I have four aggregates, we are good. Um, but if you hit like your four or five most important pages after another, like a user is coming to the page, you want to sell them something, they're getting to the cart, they need to load for other aggregates, they are buying something, and another four aggregates, that's not going to scale, that's not nice user experience. And that is something that's very hard to measure unless you've set up a realistic scenario, whether that's a scenario part again. Um, on the back end, we have the parameters of the page execution time, page size, the bytes transferred, the number of PHP function calls, file system accesses, as already explained. Then in Drupal 8, we have the render cache. So it would be freaking nice if we knew how good is my render cache performing, how much cache invalidation do I have on my site, how many cache hits do I have, and how long does it take to rebuild important caches like the menu router. Um, does it take like 10 seconds, does it take 20 seconds, or is there a problem and it takes three minutes, which was also on the site we recently had. Um, how can we measure that? Um, the back end, there's, as I said, the XHProf kit or the XHProf lib. The XHProf kit allows you to upload your runs online. Um, just check it out, github.com slash lines at slash XHProf kit, um, Apache benchmark and xdebug. Um, then there's the Symfony debug console with a web profiler, as already shown. Um, there's the S-trace. And while the web profiler is already um, nicely using the Symfony functionality to give some information also already about the caching. Uh, this internal introspection for the quality of the caches for what Core is doing, this needs to live in Core and not in Contrib, because in Core it's where we need to be accountable for, and uh, Core is not accountable to performance at the moment. Uh, here's just some sample output of how that would look from XHPROFKIT. Um, this is something that you could then uh, paste into an issue queue. Um, there's like a baseline comparison. That means uh, it runs it 100 times, and then it compares if, uh, if there was any fluctuation on the system at that point. Um, so it compares it with itself, and then it compares it with another branch. And then we see like um, there was almost no difference here. Uh, from that patch, it got a, like three milliseconds uh, slower, uh, which is obviously not so big of a problem. Um, and at the bottom, you would have like a little link that you could click. And the nice thing about that is, any one of you could profile core, 
every one of you could take a patch that has a needs benchmark tag and they would just use XHProfKit. You need to talk with someone, hey, what does it patch change? And they could, um, you could take a look and then you would install Drupal and then you would apply the patch, clear the caches and run the XHProfKit and then you can upload it. And the nice thing is then um, you don't have to like trust that what you are seeing is, um, is um, yeah, it's 20 milliseconds slower. Why is it slower? But you can click on the link and you can see the XHProf output automatically uh, with all the data you can drill down. You can see, ah, that's why it's slower. And that was very helpful because the trick contributors were kind of like doing the benchmarking and it was slower and then was saying, okay, that's okay because it only happens like one time per page and that's okay and then was kind of uh, saying to the core committer as well, this is slower, but it's okay because it only happens under that circumstances. Um, then we have the database, obviously, average request response time, the number of total queries, but what's nice to have there is we need it grouped by DB operation, so 1,000 inset query, 10,000 inset queries, number of slow queries, number of queries without indexes, um, then the ca query cache quality, it will be DB cache quality. For example, if your query cache is used across all sites, you have several sites hosted on the same thing, uh, then what we had was a query cache contention because it was using cache tables in the database. Normally wouldn't do that, but the client insisted. Um, and because they were all kind of writing to the same cache database tables, uh, the query cache was totally uh, blown out of the water and the test suite that took normally a run of uh, two hours was running four hours just because of the query cache contention log and changing some parameters fixed it. Um, again, the database can be measured with a Symfony debug console. Should be showing you all the queries. Currently it's broken, so I'm not doing a demo. Um, then um, if you get a slow query log, there's something really cool you can do to uh, get some idea. For example, what we usually do is we do it monthly. Um, which is kind of automated performance tracking. Um, so we are taking from production the slow query log, and then we run the PT query digest command on it from Percona, and that's giving you a very nice overview of um, all that you can do, uh, of all the queries, which are the most slowest queries, which are hit most often, which have the most problematic no indexes queries, etc. And if that's empty, great. But don't forget to lower the threshold because two seconds by default is a little high. So just put it down to 300 milliseconds, then you will see something. Uh, another possibility is to use a MySQL tuner, which again can say you, well, the query cache is like only 30% used, so might be a problem. Or it's 90% used and there's a nice hit radi ratio. Great. Um, so most things like MySQL, etc., have this kind of introspection internally. But in core, we could also kind of collect this introspection data and report it because we know how long each query takes. We could aggregate it. We could average it. We could report on all of that. And I don't think the overhead would be so much more if done in an efficient way. For example, there's a possibility to use a little memcache queue or something like that. We're just writing data to memory, which is obviously not that slow. The last thing is uh, remote services like memcache Redis or a remote API call. You could have the average request response time, number of total requests, uh, the number of operations per request time. For example, if you have 40,000 memcache sets, that's a, a absolute number that might be okay. But uh, if you just have 2,000 gets, that might lead to a problem in your code um, or 8,000 part operations for your web service. Um, but how could we measure those remote services, uh, the HHPROF, um, that works some. Um, but overall, there are no tools except um, things like New Relic, which gives it for you on the map. But uh, for the pure open source only solutions, there are no tools. You currently don't know. So what we could do, we could use a, a Guzzle driver. We could add some uh, introspection into there and also report, well, uh, this page is doing um, 
doing like this Facebook graph API saying, oh, it's getting a Twitter feed, etc., on the live data. And that would make me as a performance engineer very happy if I was like loading a page and then in the in the debug console it was having like a big red um, big red cross and was saying like, hey, this page made live HTTP requests. That's not a good thing to do. It would also make the development much easier. The last thing is scalability. As I said, it depends very heavily on the infrastructure. So I'm just assuming a standard large-scale Drupal structure here, SSL termination servers, Vanish cache servers, a number of web heads, one MySQL master, uh, sorry, one MySQL primary uh, thing, M MySQL replicas, that's a new language, and um, KMM cache Redis servers, L Apache solar servers, and then one of the things that's most important for the scalability here, less automated performance tracking, but still important, is how much memory do we need for PHP? And that's the max clients is equal to the server memory to the PHP memory. For example, 300 MB with 8 gigabyte RAM, you have like 22, 24 clients. So if a client comes to you and says like, I need to support 100 clients, and you have to say to him, well, with that memory requirement for that site, we need at least four web heads. Five is better. Uh, there's a nice script, Apache Buddy, buddy that will automatically calculate that for you. Um, how could you measure that uh, scalability? Now we're back to the optimization part. You could do a JMeter load testing. You could do a load testing based on, based on scenarios you've created by clicking through the site with HAR files. Or you could set up behead things. If you have your behead set up correctly, um, then it will give you huge opportunities to also do performance testing because what behead should be testing are your business use case. Your most important business use cases like a user coming to the site, putting it in the cart, and then um, obviously buying the product. And if that's slow, you will know in advance, and not when the customer tells you, I've lost a thousand customers and um, it's all gone haywire. But the customer tells you, I've got 1,000 new customers because it's so fast. Um, overall, scalability is freaking hard to measure. It so differs based on the scenario or website you are having. Uh, if you have a static page served by a vanish, you can have 1,000 pages per second. If you have an authenticated user, it might be more like three to four pages per second if it's a heavily load site. Um, for core, there's probably not much we can do um, because core does not match most client sites for which scalability matters, which are complex enterprise sites. So this is just not feasible. Um, there are certain problems of the performance tracking in core. Uh, first of all, you need to, a way to install Drupal Reliable. That sounds like an easy task, but it is not. Especially in the, it might be simpler now, but especially in the beginning of the Drupal 8, Drust tight install was broken every time. And uh, you could use, of course, the test installer, but that has other problems. So you need a way to reliable install Drupal. And then you need a way to reliable, create users, nodes, terms, files. And again, uh, Dr Devil Generate was broken for many versions of Drupal 8. So it was kind of not a tool which you could do in Contrib, but you either need to do something with Incore or use something else. Um, then there's a problem if you're measuring speed with HH Prof Kit, even with 100 runs and with HH Prof League, even with averaging over that. If your machine is kind of creating a DVD mod movie while doing the one profiling and not doing it while you're doing the other profiling, you've got a problem. Um, it is not possible with virtual machines to do accurate performance tracking. I've tried it. I buy the highest uh, EC2 instance that I could for just a few minutes or an hour or something and try to run the XH prof kit and I was getting such high fluctuations that it was unusable. So I decided in the end to just purchase a dedicated server and then I was able to do reliable benchmarks on that. Um, and you need a high number of runs, so not like simply test me that's trying to cram as many sites on that one server as possible. You can only run once on one dedicated server. 
Yes, there's now also dedicated servers on demand, which might make this more possible, but there's a much higher invest in, is investment in speed measuring. Then there's also the problem of statistics. You have the minimum versus the average. The minimum might be way off, um, even though uh, in our tests it has shown uh, when we compared the XH profit, which is giving you the minimum run versus the averages uh, calculated by uh, XH profit, there was kind of always the same and matching in expectations. Um, it could mislead you. Of all, to make sense, you would need six data points per XH prof run, like the minimum, the maximum, the average, the median, the 95 percentile, and the 5 percentile, to really be sure that there are no outliers, that there's nothing wrong with the test. So um, even just profiling, not just not even automated profiling, is already very hard in that. And then there's how to report the data. Currently, XH Prof Kit only uploads the minimum run. Just didn't get to that yet. Um, but in reality, what it should do is should call the XH Prof lib and calculate the six data points and additionally upload that. And with that, you would have a nice uh, information. For the front end, we could, for example, save the HAR files during the test suite. Um, I've got a proof of concept of that. Um, in the uh, in my sandbox, there's a visual regression testing branch um, where it's possible to uh, do the full test suite, run the test suite, have it output HTML files. But as I said, the results, especially for the front end, were not that impressive. Um, we need core introspection. Contrib is good, but we need this in core. Um, what can core do? One thing is, let's use the test suite. Uh, there's so much data generated during a test run, we can use it. Um, we can, for example, collect a unique request to repair test run based on the hash of the requests that we are sending inside the test run. We can collect the timing, the HH prof run, the HTML output and the assets. But we need to, and then we also, once we have that core introspection data or we have a web profiler in core, we need to collect all the data that we gotten there. Um, the problem there is, what is a unique request query? A test run might make several Drupal get calls, um, and then it's also difficult to compare things. So there's like a deterministic random generator I've written and a monolithic clock service. So the o test run has always the same request data, so we can actually compare things properly. And now that this test run is similar to this test run, even though the code has changed. We could, after test runs, collect the slow query log after the test suite, clear it, collect it, report it, mail it to someone. Anyone wants slow query log? Um, then we have, for the front end, we collect the HIR data after the test suite, um, but fake the uh, time to first byte based on the record data, which would already give us much more information on that. And for the um, Back end, we could compare the XHPROF averages per request theory. Um, Behead is a great saver here. Um, there's a lot of talking about integrated testing, etc. And as already saying, uh, Behead is a possibility. Because as I said, if you're doing Behead right and it tests your business cases, then it already represents a real user using a real browser using your website. You, we could in install core reliable. And we could pretty much, even with JavaScript, kit users, articles, notes, etc. cetera. And um, because we are not kind of measuring how long it takes to take a note, or not need to measure that as much as viewing a note, um, the speed uh, difference that be it is a little more slow uh, would be no problem in that case. Um, Beard can also collect HAR data while it runs. Uh, Tech One has a prototype of that. Um, in our Behead branch, um, where we have tried with Phantom.js to actually run the Behead and collect the HAR files and afterwards sending them to web page test org for um, seeing how fast slower the site has gotten. And Behead can also be used for the load testing. So if you set up your Behead to do less internal things, but really just what the user does in the scenarios, then you can run a lot of that parallel on the server and uh, can use it for the law testing. For example, as a user, I want to 
buy a product and then you are putting it into a cart and testing that scenario. And that's not even that difficult to set up if you are already set up for automated testing. And there's a lot of talk in core also of we need behead testing or we need MIG testing um, where we can drive the core via JavaScript to also JavaScript data uh, introspection. As I said, introspection and core, we have the data. Let's use it. We know the number of query in a request. We know the average service request time. We know the cache quality. And Web Profiler does a lot of that already. But the next thing is we need to actually use the data and uh, not only track it for one request, but collect it on averages, have something not like New Relic, but Drupal Relic. Um, that's um, really getting this data and reporting nice graphs out of it. Um, let's create a framework that Contrib can even use more to get some more useful data out of the test suite, deterministic random, make time calls into Drupal time, collect statistics. Uh, yeah, performance collector service, Symfony has that, so that's great. We just need to ensure we can go the next step and report that as the average min-max. Uh, then we need the cache quality for hits and misses. Uh, Web Profiler already has the hits and misses, but there's no kind of uh, thing like uh, over time, what is my cache hit ratio? Because having just in the Web Profiler thing uh, just one hit is not very useful, especially for things like caches. You need to know it over time. Um, Collect the data by request, report via Symfony to October. That's done. Wow. But we need it in core, else, no performance gate. Um, okay, there's something other cool we can do. Um, we could create a profiler purely in PHP. There's no need for an extension like XHPROF or something. It's probably not that performant, but it works. We could have like like a web browser, so we need a bug to web profile my page. GoDaddy has done that with uh, WordPress, and uh, then you would know exactly how things are, and not only uh, down to the um, to the level of um, to the level of services or what we know in Symfony, but really down to the level of what we have called uh, find the string 1,000 times, that's a little too much. And well, might have been talked to him. Um, yeah, you could run the request again and profile. There is something new that was just released, and uh, or not yet released, but that's in private beta right now. Um, I've had the chance to get a demo by Fabian Potentier yesterday. Um, I got informed of that before the talk, uh, and I talked with him, and it's free for open source projects. It already has that nice button in the Chrome toolbar um, where you can like have be on your site, and then you click the button, and then you profile it. Um, it has an API, it collects the data over time, so we could think, even though that's a larger community discussion, because it's after all still a proprietary service, even if it's three years in beer, for automated performance tracking, at least maybe until we have uh, something built for core. But uh, a Sensual Labs profiler looks very, very promising overall, and it's um, giving you all that um, when you were looking at XHPROF, it was giving you way too much data, and the Sensilabs profiler is giving you just the data you need. Symphony strikes again, <laughs> or Sensilabs in this case. Um, how can we get started? Collect the data. Let's get Web Profiler in core. We have a performance gate. This is collecting the data. This should be in core. Then we need to report the data, and we need to report the data over time. We need to have a Drupal link. Um, we need to empower Contrib more to extend and use the introspection services. Um, a lot of that Symfony already provides, but there might be some other things where Contrib is not yet getting the data, but uh, that we will only know once we start collecting even more data. So there's so much data. There's so many possibilities. So let's make the performance gate enforceable, at least for Drupal 9. Thank you.
test, test, okay. Um, lots of these things that we'd indeed love to see in core, so great talk. Thanks for making, uh, for spreading the word, so to speak. Um, I've got three remarks and questions. Um, the first is uh, the Vel generate that was indeed broken very often in Drupal 8 core and was very frustrating. And we've got some good news regarding that because uh, as of three or four weeks ago, um, every single field type in Drupal core now implements a, I don't remember the exact name of the method, but something that allows you to generate a random value for that field type. So that makes it so that we can finally give it an entity, figure out which fields are in it, and then generate random values so that we can create values to Vel generate like in core. So the API for that is now in place. Wonderful. <laughs> So that's uh, the first. Uh, the second is um, the BHA testing. You mentioned that that is real user testing. I don't think it's real user testing because there is no actual user there. You're still controlling the latency. And I think the critical part is that you are controlling, not controlling the latency and you're not controlling the CPU environment that the user is running in because real users are burning DVDs, for example. So it's very useful, it's very valuable, but real user monitoring I would consider actual collecting of data with actual browsers, of people in the wild, so to speak. Um, but it's a tremendously useful thing to still have. But I would call it synthetic monitoring. Um, make sense? Um, and then the third, um, if I remember, um, all right, uh, so you were talking about introspection in core, moving web profiler in core, uh, gathering the data so that we can actually enforce the performance gate. I would love to enforce the performance gate, by the way. Um, we are making progress on that to some extent. I'm working with, I'm not sure if uh, Luca, Luca Luca from the web profiler project is here, but we are working together on making, or on getting the, the essentials of web profiler and core, the data collectors. Um, and we are working on, or hopefully that will happen. I'm not sure if it's going to be accepted into core, but things are looking looking well. We currently have the standard and minimal installed profiles in Drupal 8, but we are working on adding a profiling install profile that comes with a community agreed consensus built uh, set of scenarios. So for example, a view with 50 nodes and each with five comments. I don't know what it would look like exactly, but some scenarios so that we can have those scenarios easily recreatable in every single commit of Drupal 8. Therefore, we can compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. Um, and that comes then with those data collectors built in. And the, the coolest part, we would have a, and probably also the most contentious part, we would have a, just like we have test coverage for the standard installed profile, we would have test coverage for this profiling installed profile. And for these various scenarios, for example, a page with 50 nodes or whatever it would be, in several scenarios of course, we would track how many cache gets there would be, how many state gets, how many cache misses, how many cache hits, how many things are render cached, and so on and so on. So that goes to some extent towards fixing that and creating more awareness, but of course it is not complete. What we would need is XHProf profiling as well and met much more data, but it is a step forward, so hopefully we can work together on that one. I'm very glad. Uh Yes, thanks a lot. Um, uh, just one little remark, the BHAT is still useful uh, yeah. because what we actually, an exercise we should be doing in core is we should be trying to set up from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 uh, like every two weeks all commits and see how performance has developed over time because that would be kind of the most useful graph for all of that. And then kind of setting up the scenario with BHAT means it works also with uh, Drupal core versions that don't have that profile yet. But yes, 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 yes. Those scenarios sound great. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, just a question about, um, well, the feasibility of the, the testing, the scenarios, uh, 50 nodes with uh, 300 comments to each. Sounds very good. Could we up that number to about uh, 100,000 nodes um, to actually simulate real use of Drupal in an enterprise situation? Well, uh, usually you wouldn't have a, a page with 100,000 nodes. No, no, but in the database. Hmm? Having 100,000 nodes in a database can still uh, have Yes, for sure. Uh, that, that's another point uh, that you bring up uh, for scalability, etc. 
you're totally right that 50 nodes in a database is nice, but it does totally not represent a site with 300 modules, 1 million nodes in the database, which have two fields each. One of those fields is field collection. This field collection has another 10 fields, another field collection which has another 10 fields, and yeah, and you only that's want a weird that scenario. Certain value in something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that more goes into the direction of, of having like a profile, um, like a big data profile, which is a very useful suggestion, absolutely. Further questions, remarks? So then, what did you think? Please evaluate the session, give me feedback. It was a lot of stuff today. I hope you still learned something, enjoyed it. Um, will be very fancy performance. You can always join the groups.drupal.org high performance uh, group. Uh, you can hang out in IRC with me and others in hash Drupal performance or Twitter about it with hash Drupal perf. Uh, have fun and have a great DrupalCon. <laughs>